This episode of the Close Out Bodyboarding Podcast is proudly presented to you by Bodyboarding Victoria and Limited Edition Fins. Shane, I've always wanted to know, what's the big difference between the original Limited Edition Fins and the new Psylocke Fins? Benny, the Psylocke Fins are bigger and wider than the original LE foot pockets. So basically when you try them on, they'll actually be a size up. Psylocke's fit really well in half sizes to the original fins. So I used to be not be able to fit into the larges uh, in the original LE fins but I fit perfectly into the Psylocke large. So I just recommend everyone, if you weren't comfortable in the original LEs, go in and try on a new Psylocke. Awesome. Thanks, Shane. Back to you in the studio. Welcome back to the Close Out Bodyboarding Podcast, an audio experience where three good mates discuss their love for bodyboarding. We'll also chat about some current topics and what we're all looking forward to in the future with the sport that we're all so passionate about. I'm one of your hosts, Benny Oborn, and joining me are my two good mates, Shane Britton and Chris Watson. Welcome back, boys. Hello, Benny. G'day, Benny. As mentioned, our first few episodes are going to cover all of our listeners' kind of questions surrounding who we are and what our input has been to the sport. Last week, we got to, to chat with you, Chris, and today we're going to chat about you, Shane Britton. Mr. Britton. So, uh, you know, I know you spend a fair bit of time up in Montana uh, running your, your business out of there, but you would like to, pref- you'd prefer to spend most of your time down the peninsula. So I would love to spend 100% of my time down the peninsula. Uh, I've kind of been lucky throughout my life. Uh my dad uh, is a builder yep. and at the age of 18, uh, he was encouraged by my grandfather to, to invest in, you know, land as quickly as he possibly could. Um, he's, a, he's a twin. Mm-hmm. So, um, both my uncle and my dad bought a block of land in Blair Gary uh, when they were 18, just as a little, little uh, investment property. Um, so when when the Mornington Peninsula was no kind one of, knew yeah, what the Mornington Peninsula was. Yeah. No one knew if you said Blair Gary, they'd say where the hell is that because <laughs> that was really what it was like way back then. Do you remember what they paid for those blocks back then? He paid, I believe, sixteen thousand dollars for the oh. block of land. Wow! Yeah, at the age of eighteen. Which uh, is a lot of money for an yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it was directly behind my grandparents' house down here. Um, basically, history of his family was they used to come down and camp at White Cliffs yep. in Rye. Um, basically, every summer had a massive group of friends down here that they used to come every summer or basically every school holidays and camp down there uh, until my grandparents sort of bought their house and and dad bought the block of land. So we used to basically come. Every weekend, every school holidays, uh, you know, we lived in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, um, you know, first in Vermont, then in Monterna. And then we um, used to every weekend come down here and there was a caravan on the block and we just lived in the caravan and, yeah. What was the, the journey like from Monterna down to the Mornington Peninsula back then? Obviously, now you have the freeway. Yep, yep. Well, uh, you it was all back roads, so you'd come down like Stud Road and then Frankston Danny Long Road and oh, then, yeah, well, through Frankston. Yeah, and stuff yeah, like that. yeah. <laughs> all, the, yeah. all those dirt roads and everything. So, uh, yeah, it took a little while. It, um, yeah, it's a lot quicker these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like your current commute on a Monday morning where you are. Uh, nah, just- I get up in the morning and, you know, drive straight to work in Bayswater. You, so. you, you pretty much, oh, you wouldn't see many traffic lights until you. Yeah, hit uh, just off East Link. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, Canterbury Road. So, yeah, it's a bit weird. Like, I guess we kind of lived in two worlds, um, you know, from a very young age. So, I had a really good group of friends down here in Blegarry. Had a good, you know, really good group of mates uh, in one turn with high school and primary school and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, you all grow up together. Um, but, you know, you'd be asked out to a party on a Saturday night and you go, no, nah, I'm down the beach or, you know. It might work the opposite way. So, you know, sort of weird, you know, especially in school holidays, you come back and catch up with all your high school mates and, you know, what have you been out there, been out partying or which, whatever. Which had Sup, the better yeah, parties. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> which had the better parties, the coast or up in oh, town? Oh, I've been to a few of both. So. <laughs> <laughs> the parties are better these days, as you know, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you came down here uh, with a family and stuff like that. What was your sort of influence in getting into bodyboarding? Like, what started that that passion inside you? Yeah, well, Dad's 
because of his time down here, he's always real passionate, or what I would say, ocean person. Yeah. Uh, always been really good in the water, swimmer, uh, because he's a twin and an identical twin, really. My uncle and him are fairly competitive. They, they work together. Um, so, you know, everything was competitive, you know, played footy, played cricket, you know, who was better at this, who was better at that. Um, so, you know, coming down here, it was the same thing. Um, you know, you come down here and just, he was really good in the water, basically. Um, body surfing, uh, scuba diving, uh, not scuba diving, skin diving, just free diving and, you know, getting fish and abalone and everything down here. So, it's, it's kind of weird. I look back at it now. We got really pushed into swimming yep. uh, a lot. And you just don't realize what that impacts you uh, on your life for the future because it's, it's just so important, you know, when you're around that aquatic environment. And, you know, we just didn't even think. We'd just jump in the water. And he'd encourage us to do so. Um, you know, you go to Portsea and it's, you know, two foot, six foot, eight foot. You go out, boys, it's rolling in. <laughs> that was his, that was his thing. He'd, he'd go, oh, Dad, how's it look? He goes, it's rolling in. <laughs> it wouldn't matter what size it was. It, it's really funny you bring up that point because, you know, I I personally have a really strong belief that every every kid in Australia should learn how to swim. Yeah, be quite, absolutely. I, I have that 100%. We're, we're surrounded by ocean. You're going to be like that. And, you know, as we talked about last episode, I travel extensively. And traveling extensively, I've been with people that- I've been with them for the first time they've seen the ocean. Yeah. And that is mind blowing to me. So yeah. like, you know, I lucky enough we've we've got this beautiful coastline near us. We we go swimming. And I I did a trip and it was like the first time I'd seen the Mediterranean and I went and jumped in the water and I had all these people like, What are you doing? What are you doing? And yeah. it's same thing. You just jump in the water and it's um it's such an important skill. Well, you know, it, should be in every year. Yeah. I, think well, I remember going up to Yarrawonga. We used to go up Yarrawonga every Easter, which mm. is on the Murray River. And, um, you know, we were going up there from toddler of when I was a toddler. But yeah. I remember getting, you know, to six, eight, ten years old. Um, you know, my two brothers, Dean's two years younger than me and Mark's four years younger than me. Um, and as soon as we get up there every year, Dad would encourage us to get in the river. Yep. And we'd swim across to New South Wales. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and had all, you know, a lot of my cousins, um, when I say cousins, a lot were my cousins, a lot were um, friends of the family that we were all sort of cousins, you know, called, you know, yep. even though they weren't my uncle, called them uncle type of yep. thing. So, we'd, we'd get all get up there and, you know, all my cousins were sitting at the top of the, on the banks and watch the three of us swim across the Murray with dad. Yep. And it's not till later in life you go- Oh, you know, I can understand why people would question that, you know, <laughs> you know, you're putting yourself into situations and, and you think, oh, you know, why, come on, come with us. And yeah. it's like, you know, that we're not capable of that. And it just realizes how much that swimming background with what we used to do um, really impacts on your life. And even, even further in life, when I, you know, 16, 15, 16, I used to bring mates from Montana down here um, and take them surfing and, there's some treacherous speeches down here as well. well. That, that's what I wanted to kind of lead on to, to, yeah. to give our listeners a bit of a perspective about the coastline that, that you guys call home. Yep. Like where the Mornington Peninsula is obviously on the eastern side of Port Phillip Bay. Yep. Which mm-hmm. joins on to Bass Strait. Yep. For those that, that understand Bass yeah, Strait. Straight out of Bass Strait. Yeah. Many, many, many years ago, you know, mainland Australia was connected to Tasmania. Yep. The dynamic of, of the globe changed and then water flooded in. Yep. Why Bass Strait is considered one of the most dangerous bodies of water in the world is the average depth of Bass Strait is about 60 metres. Mm. So, on either side of Bass Strait, it goes from, you know, anywhere from three, 600 metres all of a sudden into this shallow water, which creates incredible turbulence. Um, yeah. And obviously, incredible challenges for any marine craft or people that are utilising the ocean you, to, yeah. to go anywhere near. Well, one, of, one of the most famous things uh, that ever happened on the Mornington Peninsula is Harold Holt, the Prime Minister of Australia at the time, went missing, um, you know, at Cheviot Beach, which is basically Portsea uh, in the National Park. And yeah, never got found again. So he went missing. So he went out for a swim and never came back. His famous quote was, "I know this beach like the back of my hand." <laughs> he, he did. He, it's he what did. He said before he Absolutely. passed away. And yeah, yeah. Here's a random fact: 
Do you know they named a pool after him? Yes, There's absolutely. The Harold Holt Memorial <laughs> Pool. <laughs> I think Q or something like that. Yeah, that's yeah. encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, this coastline, though, is, uh, you know, being exposed to it at a young age is really good because, like you said, you, you have that knowledge of how to read the ocean and things like that. And one of the sort of characteristics of this coast is that, uh, as opposed to, say, the surf coast where 13th and Bells is, we are often waiting for the swell to drop. Yeah. Pick up. Yeah. Like, you know, I could count on one hand how many of dead flat days we have. Yeah. There's always some form There'd of There'd be swell. five days. Not many. At, at, yeah. at best. Yeah. And the good thing about my dad, uh, he was just so encouraging. Like, never felt, I never thought, oh, that could be unsafe. Yeah. Um, and was always positive. So, um, when you're in that environment straight away, you just, yeah, jump into any situation when it comes to the water. So, how did you end up getting into start bodyboarding? You spent time, you know, fishing or, um, you know, swimming and all the rest of it. What, yep. what lit that fire? Uh, well, originally we had those cool light boards. Yep. Um, the surfboards that, geez, I, you know, <laughs> even thinking about it now just makes my stomach. <laughs> the rashes off those things that we used to get, geez, just, yeah, it makes my stomach hurt right now. Um we started going up to Marimbula uh, on the south coast of New South Wales um, every summer, uh, just for school, yeah, during, yeah, for over the Christmas break. And Dad was really trying to encourage Mum into the water, and bought a, a bodyboard, um, one of those old rubber bodyboards with the glue on fins. Yeah, oh, right. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. So, and I reckon I would have been about eleven years old. Yeah. At that point. Um, and I just grabbed it. And that mum, yep. mum, yep. mum never, mum never saw that board. Down at Short Point, just pulling in the shore Short is, Point. Yep. yep, started first time I ever bodyboarded was Short Point, Marimbula. Yep. So um, yeah, and and I still love going up there, and yeah, it's a good time up that way. Absolutely. Do you still have the board? No. Uh, I think it sort of rotted underneath my, <laughs> my grandfather's house down here. <laughs> Same as the cool light boards. Once they got stored, they uh, never came back mm-hmm. out. So, yeah, we got the board and I basically snavelled that. And then my brothers, I think, got boards each the following summer. There's similar boards. Yep. And, yeah, you mentioned brothers. You, you, you've got- Yep, so two brothers. Yeah. Um, Dean, that's yeah, two years younger and Mark, that's four years younger. Mark's my business partner. Um. You, you were talking before about how your, your uh, Cliffy, your old man, and uh, and his brother were pretty competitive. I notice your brother Mark is very competitive as I'd well. I'd say, well, Dean and Mark, yeah, um, yeah, a lot more competitive than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm competitive in certain ways, but uh, certainly haven't got the drive that either of those guys have got. Um, you know, Dean, uh, second down black belt karate. Yep. Um, is a builder, was a cop for a while, went and competed in Japan for karate. Um, you know, just a fit human being. Still so, is a fit human oh, being. Oh, I think he's dropped off a bit now. <laughs> <laughs> keen mountain yeah, biker. Yeah, he's a keen mountain biker at the moment. So, um, he's deep into that, comes and, you know, has a surf with us, you know, two or three times a year, which is good, comes out to the pool with surf, with Bodyboard and Vic. Uh, I'll so, have you know that sometimes that uh, Dean is the first person to register for the bodyboarding Vic Urban Surf well, Nights. Yeah, I yeah. kid you not. No, he's and, pretty keen. And I've had phone calls from him. I remember one of the uh, one of the sessions. He was he flew in and he's like, "Have you got a spot?" Yeah, left? yeah, <laughs> yeah, he flew, yeah. He flew in. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, "Have you got a spot left?" I'm like, "Yeah, we could get you in." He's like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm there." <laughs> and uh, and what about Marky? Uh, well, you guys all know that Mark's really competitive sort of fellow. We, we actually, we're not allowed to actually refer to Mark just as Mark. We have to say, um, you know, newly minted state title, the Open gr- champion. The, the Great Britain, the Mark, new, yeah, the new board model coming out from <laughs> Nomad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, yeah, Mark's, yeah, can the, be fairly- The trophy great. cabinet in the, uh, in the Nomad office must be running out of space. Uh, not on my side. No. <laughs> <laughs> and um i guess yeah from from marimbula yeah. like i guess that bodyboarding then started naturally transitioning down here on the mornington peninsula yeah yeah so we started surfing sereno and porty um big change from marimbula yeah it's uh to, to yeah especially here. going to porty it's uh it's kind of known as a treacherous beach <laughs> one of the most treacherous in australia i think it's sort of known as um but yeah, like I never even thought about you know that sort of thing. Um, it was never 
really something in our heads. Dad sort of kept that away from us. So, yeah. you know, he'd enjoy getting down and uh, finding the first topless chick, <laughs> you know, and setting up his towel next to her and, uh, yeah, out you go, boys. Yeah, and he'd come out for a bit of a body surf and that, and yeah, away Flat, we went. Flex his muscle. <laughs> <laughs> got, got the Speedos out. You know, <laughs> oh, mate, oil. he's still in Speedos now. That is a, one of those guys that just loves being in Speedos. Him and mum go up to Byron Bay every year and uh, spend eight weeks up there just uh, living the dream. (laughs) Not living nude, as Benny was going to (laughs) say. Any, I guess, early memories from those those surfs down here on the Mornington Peninsula? Again, it's it's an incredibly, you know, unique part of the coastline. And and, and as Chris was mentioning before, like, it it is so subject to change at the the drop of a hat. Yeah, yeah, Um, absolutely. Um, like my main memories, especially of bodyboarding down here, was was a couple of the older guys, um, you know, that I sort of looked up to, and that like Josh Morgan. Like I, I never competed as a kid. I never competed. I didn't really compete until I was forty years old. So uh, yeah, I sort of. But there was guys down here that you know you really respect and looked up to as bodyboarders. You know, you saw their names in in the mags, um, saw them on videos and that sort of stuff. Josh is definitely someone from this area. Um, yeah, that I definitely looked up to. Were they were they quite supportive towards the I guess the the grommets back then? Uh, well, <laughs> body yeah, bodybuilding in general was just at its infancy, really. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't really too big an issue, but uh, yeah, surfers, you know, surfers didn't like anyone in the lineup at that point. <laughs> it was a little bit different back in the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> there, there was always a little bit of the old grommet abuse. Ugh. I didn't really have those issues though. You know, you might have an argument out in the water, but uh, yeah, you move on from that pretty quickly. Any uh, any close encounters back then? I mean, shark wise? No, no, Ooh. just 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 in in general in the water. I mean, I, I'm Victorian born and bred as well, and, and and so is Chris. It is like some of my most frightening moments in the ocean have, have occurred in Victoria. There's just so much energy that's coming off the Southern Ocean or, or off mm. Bass Strait. It's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not keeps, for, you in, keeps you in check. Personally, not for me. I do recall at Porty, my cousin getting, you know, sucked out, no lifeguards on the beach um, and sucked a long way out to a point that my uncle and my father thought he was gone. Wow. Um, and my brothers and I were just out surfing. We didn't even realise sort of what was going on. So, your cousin was on a board or just swimming? Uh, he was on a board. Um, but, yeah, sort of got pulled in, you know, as rips do, you know, Half a K down the beach. And this was before was the following. Blair Johnston oh, Memorial. Johnson Memorial rip. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. <laughs> it's amazing right. how far that rip travels. Oh, <laughs> they're everywhere. Yeah. So, you know, you've, you've had this start of bodyboarding. What sort of got you into getting into the surf industry or the bodyboard industry? Like what, what uh, you know, did opportunities arise or was it something you'd always wanted to get into? That's or? funny. Like... At a really young age, um, being on the peninsula, uh, Trigger Brothers yep. surf shops uh, down here were huge. Uh, Phil and Paul Trigger own, own those stores. They still do. Um, and my local surf shop was you know, Trigger Sorrento, which uh, Peter Wilkinson, yep. Peter Wilco, um, which I know Chris knows fairly well, that gentleman. I, I, I actually used to work in that store as a grommet. Yep. Yeah, yeah, right. Long hair back then? Uh, yeah, yeah. Typical grom, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I still remember work experience and one of the days was product testing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so when I was like 14 or 15, I walked in there and I probably was a bit annoying to a degree, like, you know, read all the mags, knew all the stuff coming out, you know, well, go, when's this coming? When's that coming? You know, I've heard this, this and that and this. And uh, he turned to the, to his assistant that was next to him, probably 25 years old, and I was, I think I was about 14 or 15, and he goes, I should be employing this kid, not you. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Classic Wilco. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that, to me, just was like the first time I'd even considered, you know, the surf industry as a job. Um, so, from there on in, anytime someone say, oh, what do you want to do? You know, I want to have my own surf shop. So, yeah, from there on in, so when you're 14, 15, your parents are listening to you and so forth, um, you know, you get to 16 and you get work experience at high school. Of course. And, you know, my parents wander in one day and go, oh, um, we've met the really nice lady that uh, owns a surf shop down in Sorrento. 
And I've gone, oh, the lady. And, you know, I'm thinking, trigger. And uh, no, it's uh, it, Quora Surfboards, um, which was owned by Frank Sambaco, one owned shaper down here in the peninsula. And also uh, <laughs> Sue, who happens to be dad's ex wife. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the old insular yeah. peninsula yeah. comes around. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of weird because. Um, yeah, I met Chris's brother. Like, oh, I would have been, yeah, 16. And he must have been like eight or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, really young. But, you know, I didn't really, I didn't know the Watsons at that time or anything like that. So, but it's funny on the peninsula. Yeah, everything's, it's very insular. You end up meeting everyone. You don't say a word, bad word about anyone because it'll be someone's cousin <laughs> or uh, uncle or, or <laughs> ex girlfriend or, or something. But yeah, I got the opportunity to work in um, quite a surfboards. Um, so, a sta- so, a stand up surfboard shop. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there wasn't any bodyboard shops yeah. back in. This was uh, 1990, would have been, 89, 90. Um, and got the opportunity to work in a surf shop for the first time at 16. Uh, enjoyed it. Uh, Frank was the same as every other surfboard shaper I've met since, surly. But you can, once you get, you know, most of those guys, and I, and I love surfboard shapers because once you get to know them, they, they love you, you know. That's just, but they, you know. And, oh, they they have their intricacies. Oh, absolutely. 100%. And one of my good friends, Glenn Edwards, uh, well known shaper for unknown bodyboards. A lot of people could not get along with that guy, and he and I were, I, I felt at the time, very good friends. So, um, and he had the same sort of tendencies as most surfboard shapers. I think, uh, I think the the name of Glenn's brand very much associated with him as a person. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. he did want to be known. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, to a degree, I, I certainly think my brother and I we've avoided the spotlight as well. I mean, it's been twenty three years for us. Um, this is only my second pod, oh, third podcast now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we don't really do interviews or anything. And no press, no press. No, no, we, no I mean, press. we've tried to stay out of the spotlight. Um, so yeah, it's sort of an interesting way of going about it, but certainly the grounding, working at Quarra Surfboards, being told by Wilco, um, gave me drive, you know, and every, when I was getting asked, what do you want to do? I want to be in a, have a surf shop and. Yeah, from there on in, everything to do with school, you know, I followed, really went hard on, you know, business subjects during high school um, and then, you know, did secondary learning, um, all business studies and, and marketing and all that as well. And every project was all about a surf brand or, you know, a surf shop and and I really focused on that. Yeah. But, you know, things take a different path sometimes as well and it certainly did for well, 10 years. Well, starting a surf brand is something that can't be done overnight. Absolutely. So, what, um, yeah, I mean, what did you do for the next decade? Yeah, yeah. So, when I was um, at TAFE, you know, doing all that learning and that as well, I started working for a furniture removal company. Um, a lot of people might know in Australia, Kent Removals, which is, you know, pretty well um, a national company, um, you know, one of the biggest removals companies in Australia. And so, that, is that the family surname, by the way, Kent? Was it Kent? It is, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So, it's actually <laughs> my uh, my grandfather, um, well, my grandmother and grandfather, my grandmother, sis- my grandmother's sister was um, Mr. Kent's wife. As you so, were saying before, insular. So, <laughs> it's very insular. Very and insular. they actually owned the house above um, Plagary Yacht Club. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, everyone's related. Yeah. So, what were you doing at Kent's? Uh, so, I started in the trucks. Yeah, just the heavy off, lifting. Just as an offsider. Yeah. yeah, did that for a long time, five years or so. I mean, it shows. You've got broad shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I'm carrying this podcast, that's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Not very bright, but I can lift heavy things. That's how, that's how I roll. He can't spell rock, but he can lift one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, did, you know, just doing normal fence removals, um, you know, moved into uh, business relocations, um, went into the warehouse, ran the bond store, which is basically the international shipping department. Um, and learnt all, you know, the international shipping side of things and sort of warehousing. Well, that's a pretty handy, uh, I guess, skill set to, to pick up. Absolutely. Considering what you do now. And then I moved into the office and did project management for um, like large scale office relocations. So, say, uh, ESO or, uh, 
you know, uh, like a travel lodge or something like that was getting fitted out. Yep. Uh, I project manage all that sort of stuff. And that was a, a 10 year kind of career path for you? That was 10 years. Like basically from, you know, walking the door, not knowing a thing. Um, to leaving with you know, basically a lot of project management skills, warehousing skills, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So, what then led you to where you are now? That, was there a turning point? Did you get to that end of that decade and go, I've done my time? It's Yeah. yeah well, when I went into the office and started doing project management, um, was sort of like, it was sort of a 90, you know, 7, 98, 99 type of thing. I obviously still had that dream of, you know, getting to the surf industry. I think in during that time, I'd even applied for jobs at Rip Curl, sending, you know, resumes and all that sort of stuff, just, you know, hoping for that opportunity to come up. No bueno? Oh, no. <laughs> I never even got a phone call. Ouch. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but then uh, we went to Nationals down here. I think it was 99. 99. Nationals yeah, 99 at Portsea. At Portsea. Yep. And there was some guys uh, that we got to talking to in the car park down there and they were selling T-shirts out of the back of their car um, as a bodyboard brand. I think they were called, I'm going to say 360 or something like that, but they were actually in Croydon, which, um, you know, was two suburbs away from me in Montana. And that was like, I said to my brother, you know, I, I can't believe these guys are getting something off the ground and we haven't started getting anything off the ground. So, Mark was always a part of that conversation as yeah, well? Yeah, well, to be honest, Mark and I are lucky. We, we, scare, uh, we share um, a skill set that neither uh, has. Um, Mark's really good. Um, I mean, you don't you don't even own a laptop. Oh, I own a laptop. doesn't work. <laughs> 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 so, uh, he's heavily IT. Uh, he worked for a pre-press company. So, he's got a lot of, you know, that sort of skill um, and I've got the, you know, management, project management skills and-, and Essentially, the, the, the face of the brand. The heavy lifting. Mark or me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the pretty face of the brand, unfortunately. <laughs> we're, uh, after Mark's performance at the state titles, we're waiting for the big posters with Mark Britton. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The new advertising campaign yeah, yeah. is rocking full, Yeah, full full shop front kind of image. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's actually asking if you guys want to do a boat trip when you know he's going to go filming. And- <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We get to film him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. That's it. Yeah, yeah. One take, one <laughs> films, one take photo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, that was, yeah, turn of the century, 99 99. You're in a car park. Uh, yep. So, we started the brand basically 2000, um, established Nomad then, um, started printing T-shirts, got really good support by a company called Blue Gum. But you were still working at Kent's at this time. Uh, I was. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I didn't quit Kent's until 2002 right. when my son was born. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, we had really good support by a clothing company um, you know, that was manufacturing and we're doing really- sort of high-end custom clothing um, and they were about the only specialist, I think, in Australia at the time doing that. Um, and uh, one of the guys, uh, Grant Callerman, their support is heavily like, you know, I don't think really the company wanted anything to do with us, but Grant saw something in us and, yeah, really helped us out in terms of uh, producing clothing and, yeah, sort of took off. And how, how are you distributing that? That, uh, that was me. That was yeah. me just making phone calls during work hours <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, and shipping at night basically to all the all the retail stores. And that, you know, I think the first store we got on board was inverted. Um, the O'Sullivan family up on the Gold Coast. Um, I think maybe, maybe Zach Surfboards down here in Victoria and Thornbury really backed us. Yeah, you know, really early on as well. Um, and then, you know, it started rolling from there. Once you get, a, you know, a little bit of a bite, uh, a little bit of an encouragement, you sort of start pushing. And then and then you sort of rolled that brand into uh, um, doing boards and things. And I still remember as a Grom working in Trigger Brothers Sorrento, I yep. still remember the first Nomad boards coming in. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, you know, Peter Wilco really supported us uh, when those boards came out. Um, yeah, I sort of met with Glenn Edwards early on. Uh, Glenn again really supported us heavily um, and you know he, he really saw I think uh, something with the brand obviously something that could support him as well as him doing Unknown because um, he didn't really want to do stock boards at that point 
Um, so, yeah, we just started really small with him and, and it sort of rolled on from there. So, how did that – so, you had Nomad then and you sort of – you had the boards rolling from then. What about when you, you know, you've also got Limited Edition? How did that come about? Uh, limited Edition kind of started when we were starting to think about distributing other brands. Yep. Um, and wanted a company that would sort of, you know, didn't want to do it all under Nomad. It didn't yep. really make sense. So, to have that sort of overarching brand that could distribute, you know, multiple brands um, – Kind of thought it was really advantageous at the time to start working with other people and, you know, that were like-minded. Mm-hmm. Um, one of those first brands was uh, Custom X USA. Um, Debbie had a wealth of knowledge um, and, you know, to be honest, she's one of the originals. She worked in uh, Tom Maury's, you know, factory in that very early on. Um, so, you know, there was, there was definitely a wealth of knowledge, you know, to learn from her. In that early kind of stage of the, the manufacturing side of things with, with boards, like what, what challenges did you face? Because again, that I knew nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That's- I mean, you had, you had great support from, from Glenn. <laughs> yep. Um, that must have been incredibly overwhelming and, and, and borderline kind of frightening as, as a new business to go, wow, what are we doing here? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Like, you know, I, I kind of feel, I feel a lot of the time, like I feel quite creative. Um, but, I'm not very good at the hands-on type of thing, like in terms of coming up with ideas and everything. Well, you, I mean, you've you've done some incredible advertising campaigns over the years. Yeah, yeah. No, and I'm, you know, really proud of a lot of those. Um, you know, a lot of people go, oh, you know, advertising campaigns and go, oh, you know, surf shot. Like, honestly, that bores the shit out of me. Um, those campaigns are good. Like, it's good for us, good for the rider to link the rider with us. Um, but, you know, advertising campaigns, I'm sort of more proud of, uh, in that respect, would be uh, the limited edition Black Ice. I, I was about to bring and that up. The one thing that comes to mind for me, I remember seeing the limited edition Black Ice and yeah. I went and got a pair of those fins. Yeah, like, yeah. Like that, that fin in the ice block was pretty Yeah, accurate. well, everyone kind of thinks it's it's fake. Yeah. <laughs> that ad. And I actually froze a fin <laughs> in a block of ice. Yeah, what, did you did you use an esky? Like, what, what did you do? I used a bucket. Yeah, just yeah, a bucket. yeah, yeah, just a bucket that would fit the fin. Like, but but as a, as a size, you know, close enough to actually fit the fin. Like a fin box. Yeah, yeah. Size, yeah. And then um, uh, Les Halleck. Yep. Um, people might know Les. You know, he's a well-known photographer down here, um, but he's he's from the Cronulla sort of Shire region. So a lot of the bodyboard crew sort of know him from up there. And he shot Mark's. He actually shot Mark's wedding. He actually shot the photo behind me. I was yeah, going to yeah. say the photo. One of my favourite photos behind me. The photo know. I'm looking at behind you was shot by Les as well. Yeah, it's yeah. It's an amazing so, photo. You know, he's a legend. So, um, and he was just able to light it in a, in a way that just made it look spectacular. But, you know, having that idea hmm. and, and then seeing it all the way through and him and I just screwing around, you know, in a warehouse trying to make it happen was, yeah, pretty incredible. And, and you get a result like that. It's yeah, you know, pretty fantastic. But, um, I mean, tell tell us tell us about some of the other advertising ca- campaigns. Yeah, yeah. So, um, like another one, I'm really proud. Oh, there's there's probably two off the top of my head that I'm really proud of. Um, there's one we did with Lackey, the very first uh, Attica wetsuit, which was down ads. at the old military base at Point de Pin. Point correct? de Pin. So yeah. yeah, we brought Lackey down, and uh, his wife Gabby at the time uh, was a, was a good photographer. And we brought her down to shoot it. And basically, Attica, my whole idea for Attica um, was a jail. Like, Attica's known, um, the word Attica is known as a major jail in the US. Mm-hmm. Um, that's where I sort of lifted the name from. So, I really wanted that hard sort of feel about it. Um, and my first idea was to take him to Old Melbourne Jail. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually went to Old Melbourne Jail. So, Old Melbourne Jail's uh, where... Famously, Ned Kelly uh, got hung, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, we went to we went there. We went with generators and lights, and so we- you, you rented out a space. At the oh time. no, 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 no! <laughs> just no, no. I was not, you know, I was not smart enough to think that far in advance. So we went in just thinking, you know, maybe we can do it real rogue. Yeah. Wow! And <laughs> wandered in. And realised, oh, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> no. So, I was like, oh, all right, where's my backup? And I, I'm thinking, oh, I I'm not really sure how this is going to go. So, 
Yeah, weirdly, we drove out of the city. This is when uh, Eastlink had yeah. just opened up. And on the side of Eastlink, they had this really nice, you know, metal work. And we pulled up behind one of the pylons on uh, Eastlink and went, oh, we should took, take photos in front of this. So Gabby starts taking photos um, and the flash is going off. And all of a sudden, we had, had the cops roll up. <laughs> wow. And they're like, uh, what are you doing? <laughs> and we go, no, just just shooting some photos. Like we're not, we're off the road. We're well off the road. They go, no, people think it's a speed it's a camera. Speed camera. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, I mean, well, you're kind of doing them a favour. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, there's enough speed cameras on that, right? Yeah, right. yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was a no go. Yep. So uh, we so jumped stri- in the car. Strike two. Strike two. So we jumped in the car, and I thought, well, this is the last option. We got to work it out and. Came down to Point Nepean, the old army base down there, and just found an amazing location. So, the whole idea was to make it look like a jail. Yeah, very um, dark. Very dark, you know, you know, very hard man type of thing. And the way Gabby set up the lights, um, like to me now, I look at that image and think, you know, Frankenstein. <laughs> That's what it looks like. It's in, yeah. like looks like Frankenstein's castle and the lights are just flashes going off, but they, it just looks incredible. And, yeah, certainly something I'm pretty proud of. It's, you know, in your head and then, you know, it comes to light. I think, I think, I think you pulled it off pretty well, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the last, the last one I had was um, when we first purchased Function. And, um, yeah, Tully, the legend, um, you know, Dave Tullock, uh, sold us his business. Um, he'd been closed for about 12 months at that point, I think in, in 2000. 8, 2009. Mark and I sort of, you know, just wanted another brand that we could really get behind um, ourselves and we, you know, made him an offer and, and he took us up on it. And as part of that, he signed, you know, to stay part of the brand. Um, so, I had this idea because I don't know if anyone's ever met Tully, but he's a huge- He's, he's a big man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Big man. I met him at a trade show, you know, early yeah, on. Yeah, six, six foot something. And he's, yeah, he'd be, I oh, know, I don't know what he is, but he's a monster of yeah. a man. And I had this idea of um, like a horror film. But him basically walking into the shaving bay, um, but you know, or you couldn't see the actual shaving bay. It was just the door, and him basically filling up that door with with a sander in his hand. Yeah, and uh, yeah, because he was in WA, we couldn't. I couldn't project manage. You know, sort of gave the imagery, and the guys at Tungsten uh, took on that for us, and and yeah, came up, nailed it, came out amazing. Yep. Yeah, so they're the three in particular that I'm really proud of. So I mean, it's easy to chuck a surf shop. In an ad, uh, a lot harder to come up with an idea in your head and and follow through. I think. I mean, yeah, I work with really good photographers and and to pull it off. Yeah, I, th- I think. Um, I mean, brand awareness in, in bodyboarding or in any business is incredibly important. I mean, without it, you, you don't really have a business. Yeah. Um, you've you've had the the Nomad logo in some pretty obscure places, um, particularly in the air at about <laughs> just below five hundred feet. Yeah. Yeah. On the Nomad Chopper, then yeah. uh, I still get phone calls about going, oh, when's the new Chopper going? <laughs> <laughs> um, Who you got drones these days? <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. A lot, a lot, a lot this cheaper. Is, yeah, that was the most expensive drone ever to, yeah. to fly the skies. It, well, this this probably kind of ties into what, what Chris and I really want to kind of talk to you about next and just some of the film projects you and Mark have been involved in with your brands. Um, I mean, pretty incredible films. Yeah, mate. Cheers. Absolutely. Obviously, yeah, probably, correct me if I'm wrong, Rome was the first kind of big production that you put together. That was definitely the first one we got, yeah, full on into. Um, From a young age, I was sort of a fan of Endless Summer 2. Obviously, there was Endless Summer, but in the 80s, Endless Summer 2 came out. It was was that met our generation. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. So, I've still got the poster on the wall um, at home. So, um, and- really liked that style of nomadic and I just felt it, you know, it suited the brand so well. Um, you know, nomadic, uh, nomadic travel, um, you know, around the world and I was like, you know, I really want to get this across. Um, you know, luckily at the time, I think we had some of the best free surfers in the world on the team um, and they were really young and motivated. Um, had a really good filmer, Bryce Thurston, uh, as part of the crew, and yeah, you know, Bryce was really motivated as well. He just finished. Uh, was that with Brendo? Brendo Newton, yeah. Um, another one you're talking about. He'd filmed that. 
Is that where Brendo yeah, completely destroyed his face? His face. Yeah. Um, oh, it'll come to me. Yeah. Great film. He'd finish that and we'd sign Glenn to the team. Obviously, had Chris James on the team at the time um, and Lackey. And, yeah. The free surf a- division. Yes. It was the free yeah. surf division, which I think, you know, really cemented us, you know, as a really good traveling team. And to be honest, the free surf division, yes, it related to Nomad, but it really covered all the riders under limited edition at the time um, because, I, you know, we're just really pushing to get the best free surfers in the world. I mean, again, you you essentially completely stick it up a, a helicopter. <laughs> I did. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Didn't actually get seen in any of the footage. Uh, it was probably, you know, end result was probably it didn't really make sense <laughs> to do what we did. But uh, if anything, quite counterproductive. It was very and costly. Yeah, um, <laughs> and you know, wasted a little fair bit of time doing that. But um, at the same time, it you know, I think it definitely cemented us. Well, you know, we got a couple of photos out of it, which was you know really good. And and then and those photos are now so so historic. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, and kind of iconic, and yep. and certainly iconic with the brand. So, um, how did you? I guess who came up with that concept? Again, it was pre-drone. Yep. Um, let's be honest. The the cost of chartering a helicopter is incredible. Yeah, yeah. Even in current times, you're looking at around fifteen hundred dollars an hour. Yep. For a pilot and a and a chopper. Um, well, it was kind of lucky that that area of the world is littered with choppers, um, and it was a matter of just speaking to the right pilots and yep. so forth. Uh, the idea was more, you know, just to stand out as a brand. Um, and, you know, at the time, the boys were really focused on surfing lunars, um, which is, yeah, I can see why as, as free surfers and, and big wave riders that they were. Um, so I was just trying to come up with a concept that that was different and, yeah, just started ringing, you know, because of that area. I won't say exactly where it is, but it's uh, there's it's quite a few chopper. It's no secret, spots. mate. I know. <laughs> I know, but, you know. When I try and be respectful to any, everyone's any, areas. Any beach that has a, a car park, mate, and a, and a set of stairs generally isn't isn't too much of a secret. True. Um, mate, and obviously some really kind of cinematic editing for that, that, that film. Yep. Um, and then that obviously led in. Yeah, well, we're lucky. Um, like Bryce filmed that entire film. Um, Todd Barnes came in at the last minute to edit. Um Bryce had a couple of health issues at the time and, yeah, um, Barnsley was really good to come in and, and help us out with that and, yeah, did a fantastic job. And to be honest, I do think with, you know, the projects, I, I do think it was better that Bryce film and Barnsley edit. I think it, it came up, yeah, amazing, better than I ever thought in my head. Yeah, Bar- Barnsley has a very, I guess, unique um way of telling a story Absolutely. and, and that, that shows in the way that he produces and edits films. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess then moving into like Rome too, you could see that difference because correct me if I'm wrong, he didn't have- Correct. Yeah, that Barnsley yeah. didn't do the so, answer for that. For Rome 2 uh, was a much bigger, more expensive project because Rome had done really well and we had the budget to do so. Um, Bryce obviously filmed that project again, but was there to edit as well. Uh, the- f- yeah, the result, I mean, you know, a lot of people like that film, which is great. I mean, I think Hardy's section in that's fairly iconic. Um, a lot of people love that section. Um, it wasn't- I thought the intro to that film was incredibly memorable. Just Oh, that. yeah, yeah. Because it was, you know, we were trying to mir- mirror entourage to a certain yeah. degree of that. And, you know, Bryce had the big hammer at the time and so forth. Dodge, and- Dodge I think. Was it Dodge? Uh, no, didn't he? Oh, I can't remember now. I'd have to go back and watch, rewatch yeah. it. But I know he, Black bought, Dodge, I he think. bought the Hummer, but maybe it was a different vehicle for the- Maybe it was, yeah. Yeah, maybe it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I'll be honest. Like, he did the one edit and we're meant to go back and say, oh, I think, you know, change here, change there. That's that's sort of my job as a producer. Um, that didn't happen. No. Yeah, he, yeah, that was pretty much the right at the end of our relationship at that point. I th- you know, I'd like to think that with Glenn, like, you know, both those guys, you know, ended up moving on and, and doing other things. Um, and we had a bit of a falling at that point. But I do hope now that, uh, you know, we've caught up since and uh, hopefully moved on. Because those guys, you know, did a lot for me at the time. Uh, hopefully, I, hopefully I, they feel the same, but I did a lot for them. And... Um, 
yeah, I, I loved spending time with them and their other brother Berg. And um, and, and fr- from there, the Rome series continued, and then then you you kind of segued and did some other projects, and now you have um, Michael Jennings, who's been working with you for a number of years, yep. essentially to almost oversee the production of all of these projects. And- Absolutely. So, Geno's been full on with us for you know, many years now. Um, you know, COVID, you know, that's, that's kind of kicked us in the balls. Um, you know, we had, we had quite a few projects in mind, you know, leading up to that point and, you know, the whole team was self-motivated and, and ready to go on that stuff. And then COVID hit, um, you know, I'll, and, you know, I'll take a hit for that myself, um, you know, following, you know, the epidemic and all that sort of stuff, you know, you know, and you guys will, will be the same. We like, we lived in the most locked down state in, in, I believe the world. I think it still is the world at this point. And, uh, you know, that hurt me as well. Like, you know, I wasn't trying to encourage guys to travel and I still haven't probably now. Um, but certainly, I'm hoping going into 2023, 2024, we start kicking in with some really exciting new projects again. How do you think that, like, you know, back in the Rome days and some of those other films, like it was more so that DVD to consumer sort of model. Yep. Now where we've got a streaming generation, like, you know, as we've talked about previously, um, I watch pretty much everything streaming yep. and, and a lot of people do. How do you think that's affected projects? And you know- oh, it's, 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 you know, I don't think anyone in bodyboarding's figured out how to, you know, get their money back. Yeah. Um, it's really difficult. Like, you know, Rome and Rome 2, like Rome 2 in particular, I put, uh, you know, a fair bit of money into Rome 2 and, but got it all back. You know, where, where we own the DVD rights, we sold the DVDs. Etc. So you get that money back, and then you put it into the next one. Um, DVDs sort of start dying as, as YouTube and streaming, and that sort of happened. So we pivoted again. Um, had an amazing relationship with Riptide at the time, and started you know working with Riptide and, and putting our films on the cover. Yeah, of, distri- uh, distributing the, the yeah, old, just the old cover basically DVD. completely changing a distribution stream um, for your bodyboard films and, and your advertising. So we started putting all our advertising budget into the films, and then the films would go onto onto the covers of magazines. Um, and we, you know, we had a really good reaction to that. Obviously, this is Africa was on the cover of Riptide. Um, what else was on the cover? Uh, Lucky Project, in particular, I think Rome, Rome Free, uh, Rome Diaries, or oh, Rome Diaries. Yep, yep, and maybe Salt Horizon. Might have been the first series of that. May have been on the on the cover as well. Is it true? <clears throat> you have not been on a single surf trip with your team. Uh, that is correct. <laughs> oh, well, hang on. I, I was, it's a yes or no question. <laughs> I was on the chopper trip. I was there. On um, the beach or in the chopper? I was on the beach. Yeah. He was flying his chopper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Project management from afar, mate. That's yep. Uh, yep. sort of how I had to go about it. And these days, I'm a lot freer. Yep. Um, you know, at that point, I had two young kids. Managing a team, managing a business, um, very difficult. And now I'm sort of like, I can, I'll, I can just come with you. Is it- Are you going it, next week? Are we going Tuesday? Let's go. Is it uh, something you'd, you'd like to do? To, Absolutely. To, to be on the road with, with the crew? Uh, I think it's, um, it's a fallacy that I've never been on the road because yeah. I'm probably more on the road than the team ever is. Yeah. Um, you know, I spend eight- Weeks a year on the road, seeing all our stockers. Um, Which you're the- starting pretty soon, yeah? Yeah, in a couple of weeks' time. Right. So, uh, you know, get to travel, see every surf shop, you know, on the whole eastern seaboard and across to South Australia and Victoria and everything as well. Um, I really enjoy that. I don't really enjoy the solitude of the driving and the, and the nights uh, in motel rooms, but I've also got a heap of amazing friends uh, that I've met over the years that I stay with and and so forth. And I really enjoy seeing all the surf shops and seeing what's going on. You'll have um, to find some decent podcasts for that. Trip. Oh, mate, there'll be. <laughs> do you know any? <laughs> Watch this space. Oh, it's amazing, <laughs> mate. And I, I guess to talk talk a little bit about your team. Yep. Um, and I'm probably going to do this in a bit of a reverse cycle. Yep. Like you, you got a really good crew of guys un- under the the brand labels at the moment. Yep. Um. T- tell us about who they are, 
you know, why you, you kind of picked them to represent your brand and, and maybe then go back a little bit to tell us, you know, who came on board first and, and how that progression for your, for your team riders came. Yeah, so at the moment we've got uh, Matt Lackey obviously riding the team. He's pretty much our longest serving rider. Um, love the bloke. He's a champion. It's more, more than a decade, correct? Uh, it's almost two decades. Wow. We're almost wow. to, to 20 years. Oh. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, pretty incredible and, you know, he and I have got a good relationship. Um, hopefully we'll get him on the podcast at some point uh, <laughs> if, if he's not too busy, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, obviously, Lachlan Cramsey, uh, absolute champion from the Sunshine Coast, four-time um, Australian ABA winner. Uh, Michael Novi. Uh, who, you know, we've had a relationship with him for a long time. Um, he wasn't riding for us back then, but even in Rome and Rome 2, um, he was a major part of those projects. Um, so, you know, is a welcome sort of, you know, was really welcome to come onto our team, um, you know, when he did. So that was fantastic. Um, Sam Thomas, who's bringing a lot of energy from Dan Tassie at the moment, um, really motivated to travel um, does doing a lot of trips in across South Oz and through to WA. Um, yeah, so he's a really welcome addition to the Nomad team as well. And then obviously under function, we've got uh, Joe Clark, the legend himself. Another ABA. Another tour ABA winner. tour winner. Uh, Chase O'Leary straight out of Port Mac, who's, uh, you know, just, just a cruisy legend. Um, and then obviously Jones Russell, um, yeah, out of Port Mac as well. And Tom Morris, so again, just bringing some energy out of the WA, um, you know, really good. So, yeah, yeah. So that's the current sort of team at the moment. Yeah. So let, let's go back to the very beginning. Like, who, yep. who is the the first person you brought onto the the Nomad team, and 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 under what kind of pretext? Yeah. Well, from memory, oh, right, the actual first ever team. Right first. Oh. Kiowa O'Sullivan. Who is family owned inverted, inverted on, uh, Gold Coast. Up on the Goldie. Right, yeah. um, owned inverted at the time. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, they were really nice family yep. too. Um, Chris Clarson. So Chris was living on the northern beaches, but he's uh, out of Ballina. Um, yeah, legend. Um, really nice bloke. You know, like they're the main two off the top of my head. Like, as in really early on. So, was this when it was just clothing? Yeah, just yep. clothing. Um, I think Dion Myers was on for a little bit then as well. Great guy, Dion. But that got a bit confusing because we are just starting to launch boards. Right. Um, and he was with BZ, I think, at the time. So, that got a little bit confusing. Who was the first pro model for Nomad? Uh, Lackey. Yep. Wow. I'm fairly confident. Oh, no. The outlaw himself, Josh yeah, Kirkman. The outlaw. Ah, Might have been right. the outlaw, I think. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, Josh is a legend too. So, um, yeah, we've had you know, good relationships with a lot of guys that have been around for a long time. So, it's good. You know, I love seeing what Josh is doing now um, with his podcast, but, you know, he's also doing all his- uh, Some really good environmental and absolutely. sustainability work. Is, yeah, is yeah. Terrific. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, he was really good. His whole family was um, really supportive of us at the time. Um, and yeah, we did a couple of really good photo shoots sort of in around that area where he's from and, um, yeah, it was a good time. Mate, um, any, anyone on the radar to, to maybe join the, the, the team in the future? I mean, look, I know we're, we're joking about the Mark Britton. You know, pro model, are mate, we? but it's a, it's a, it's a serious we are, question. But I don't think he is. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he rang up Cramsey and said, by the way, your your board model's going to be changed to Great Britain because I've just won yeah. two state rounds. <laughs> you, you got to admit, mate, it's it's catchy. It, it is. is. The no, Great Britain. I, you know, I love it. <laughs> why wouldn't you launch that? That's, yeah. uh, it's, marketing, it's a marketer's dream, mate. <laughs> the great Britain. Uh, young guys at the moment. Uh, obviously, we've got Ned Johnstone down here in Victoria um, and uh, Ned's like a close personal friend uh, as well. I'm really close with his family. Um, seen him grow up through, basically, uh, we met at uh, Nippers, basically. we uh, Both my kids have been through all the Nippers campaigns with uh, Life Saving Victoria. Um, again, like going back to what we are talking about earlier and the importance of being, you know, water safety in, in an aquatic environment. That was my main goal really early on to get them both swimming 
And so, you know, we pushed really hard and they've both been through, you know, the entire NIPA campaign. My son ended up working for Lifestone Victoria as a as a paid lifeguard um, around the beaches on the Morning, Mornington Peninsula. Um, so it's been really good. But through that, seeing a lot of Groms on the peninsula and especially Ned um, do really well. And, like, to be honest, he didn't need my support. He, he was already surfing really well before that. So, yeah. But outside of that, it's really hard to identify talent at the moment. Um, not having mags, not seeing films, the amount of, you know, kids filming back in the, you know, especially the 2000s, um, you know, shooting with cameras, photog- you know, photographers, filmers, just the amount of content that was being produced was amazing and it gave everyone opportunity. Right now, it's really stagnant um, and, you know, I'd love to see that sort of come back and it's it's almost generational. You just need that generation to start picking up a camera and shoot their mates. It, yeah. It's really quite interesting. Like, uh, you know, I think you and I watched the How Surfers Get Paid that stabbed you, yes. which is probably one of the best documentaries I've watched in a long time. Yeah. And it's sort of- Brutally honest. Very brutally honest. Yeah. And, and even the- talking about pay from back then into now and, yes. the, you know, saying what's going on. And that's definitely happened with bodyboarding as well. Um, so, yeah, it's really- and. Also, In terms of scale, it's almost mirrored. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And also the influencer piece there, you look at what Jamie O'Brien or some of those guys, you know, that's is that what you'd sort of be looking for for, I, I shouldn't say them as an influencer, but building content? You, oh, it is, but, you know, honestly, I just like to have some juniors on board, um, yep. you know, that are really keen and motivated. Yep. Um, that was our success early on, um, finding those really – motivated free surfers. There's a lot, of, a lot of guys at that time doing the IBA and all that sort of stuff as well. And I could see the IBA was really taking a lot of their time and money away from them. Um, and that's why we really pivoted hard to free surfing. And uh, yeah, like, you know, guys like Damian Martin, Ewan Donachie, um, you know, Adam Lumen, we had Max Aaron, you know, all those guys have ridden for us over the years. Um, you know, Kirkman and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I, I really had a, had a change of pace for me when I saw Josh <laughs> go through a real hardship uh, with the pipe comp one year uh, where he missed a heat, but, you know, he was he was doing really well in that comp and, and he missed a heat. Um, Which wasn't, correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't any fault of his own. I don't believe so. He was told the comp wasn't on and and then it was on. Um, you know, got told. I don't know if he had to check a phone call or something and it yeah. said. Yeah, yeah like a hotline. So if, yeah, like yeah, event yeah. Hotline. And it said the comp wasn't on and it was actually on. So, yeah, and that was heartbreaking for him and, you know, he was basically done straight after that. Um, which was really sad because he was such a talented rider and and we were on the verge of, you know, going into the Rome series and that and it would have been great to have him as part of that as well. Mate, um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm probably almost going around in circles. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, 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 I'm not I'm, sure I'm answering every question no, as you go along, I'll be you, honest, you are, I'm just rambling. I, I, I just have so many questions and I mean, I've, I've known you for so long and I've, I've probably asked yeah, yeah. a thousand times well, before. Well, you and I, with our, we've got a long personal relationship. Yeah. Uh, we've done a lot of trips together. <laughs> yeah. We've had a lot of good times together. We've been to the Cook Islands together. Oh. Went to Robe last year together. You know, did, did the Great Ocean Road last year as well. Like, we've, you know, we'd spent a lot of time together. So, uh, plenty more to come, I hope, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a, a bit of a, you know, a nut for, for, for board technology. Yep. Um, I know bodyboarding as a sport is, is, is still relatively young in comparison to some of the other, you know, sports that you see. So, evolution of uh, like equipment and materials to obviously improve performance, I find really interesting. Yep. Like, and again, you've been 20 plus years in doing this. Mate, how have you seen, I guess, change in, in, not so much materials, but perhaps design and improvements to structures that, you know, that has brought us to where we are now. Yeah, I think um, a lot of the manufacturers at this point, like certainly the factory we work with, they're very focused um, on reducing waste, but also creating, you know, different materials that and, – and Johnny, who owns the factory, um, is – He's basically known as a genius when it comes to materials and so forth, um, Johnny. Yeah. So, 
um, he's really focused on creating, you know, different densities and so forth with material that will then have impact on, on the writer's abilities. Um, so we've been able to really push that, especially with our cores um, in the last couple of years, you know, introducing D12. We've just introduced a new, you know, what we call in Z core, which is a really low lightweight polypro that we're saying is basically in terms of low end PE boards, um, we'll replace that. So basically that PE is dead and uh, the future's dead. Basically, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty much how, how we're pushing it. Basically. Trademark. Yeah, yeah. Hashtag <laughs> trademark. Yeah, you know, so stuff like that, you know, we've, the technology that Johnny uses as well, um, we've brought in uh, like the PRS, the tapered stringer. So it basically looks like a, a fishing rod um, where it tapers along the line. So it gives you more flex in the nose uh, and stiffer in the tail. Um, the reason that's really good through our factory is that the core actually uh, gets in, like the stringer gets embedded in the core. So Rather than being drilled. Correct. So it gets inlaid. So there's no compromising of structure to the core whatsoever. Yeah. So that this, and that's happened, you know, whether it's PRS um, or a standard stringer, but PRS, it works really well because, because it's tapered, you know, other factories can't have to drill a hole. Yeah. Where this is actually inlaid into the core, and you know the core, and then the foam is the essentially push, blown, yeah, into blown the in around it. Yeah. So the structure is perfect. Mm. You don't have the open cells that you would if you drilled holes or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, correct. And uh, as part of that factory uh, is also Mark Dale, and Mark owns the number six body boards. And to be honest, I reckon is really underplayed in the industry. I think Mark's kind of a futurist. Um, you know, a long time ago, he was coming up with ideas of, you know, printing on decks and slicks and, you know, doing quad channels and, you know, very different sort of quad channels. Just more of that thinking outside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we way. brought his boards in uh, early on into Australia and they were kind of rejected because they were... Almost. They were different. Well, the reason, well, the reason they were different at the time is because um, Australia was really, you know, on the cutting edge of modern templates, and Mark was doing vintage templates. Like he was doing, you know, sort of tributes to old, you know, BZ models and, and so forth. Um, so he had those sort of templates in mind, which was selling amazing in the US, but was highly rejected. Wasn't resonating here in Australia. Well, certainly not. To what you know, but he was ten years too early. Um, you know, similar to quad channels, he was doing, you know, these, this covenant board with crazy quad channels and so forth. Um, now quads are kind of a standard thing on, on bodyboards. So, um, you know, when you, when you're able to work with people, um, and be influenced by them, um, and that's what we've done with a lot of our distributors and that as well. You know, the brands we've distributed, like Custom X, as I was talking about before, you know, we've had, had opportunities to, you know, work with, you know, Todd at QCD and also done JG boards. Yep, like did, you said, number yep. six GT boards. Yep, we don't work Custom with Custom X USA. Yep. What have I missed? Uh, well, that pretty much covers everyone, I think. Um, but yeah, like you work with all these people that are, you know, they influence your thinking, and and I appreciate that, mate. Again, it, incredibly long and in depth history in the industry, and and so far, I guess we've makes me feel old. <laughs> You're not a spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so, I guess we've probably, you know, talked a lot about the success you've had in business. Yep. And, you know, like you said, you've also kind of gone under the radar. And, you know, my next question is like, what else has gone under the radar? Like, I personally know, like as a business, you, you, you've had your challenges. Like, yep. um, one that's probably a bit of a an ongoing joke but between your close friends is, you know, the Foo Fighters. Do, do, do you want to? <laughs> uh, yeah. Can you can you tell everyone a little bit about what happened there? Yeah. And correct can... me if I'm wrong. I, I think I was the first one to bring this to your, your attention. Oh no, we had there was a lot of support online yep. very early on pointing it out. Yeah. Um. So basically, Mark and I we bought Function in 2009. Um. In 2012, we basically did a rebranding of the brand. Um. Tully had done this amazing. Basically, it looks like a snake, yeah, but it's two Fs eating itself, basically. Um, we felt the round logo was a bit too similar to, to Nomad, Nomad. Having yep. you know, when yep. you're distributing two brands, you got 
two logos that look, you know, kind of similar. So we did a redesign of that and we made it, a, you know, a, you know, basically a square diamond shape using a lot of the aesthetics that Tully had set up in the logo, but rebranding it under our own, you know, steam basically. And which still is the current function. It's the current logo. function logo. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's something we were real proud of. You know, anytime you come up with a logo and it's unique and everything and you you love it. And so, yeah, so cut to sort of five years later and we start getting tagged on social media. Our lawyers, uh, Michael Morehead, who lives down here in the peninsula, Michael's really well-known surfer down here. Uh, he was a junior champ. He's, he's from Tasmania. Um, so he kind of knows my business in terms of how it rolls and so forth. Um but is also, you know, a high level barrister and, and so forth as well. So, um, yeah, and, he, and he's a good mate as well. So, uh, so that he helped us out. But, you know, what you think might be a, a quick solution basically took us two years of, of two, you know, what I would call devastating, you know, for me personally, you know, two years and a resolution was set. And uh, there's an NDA signed and Dave Grohl and I have got our names on a bit of paper together with our signatures next to each other. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's about- Is that pretty, is that pretty cool? Uh, or is it it still depends a- if you've been through the situation. <laughs> 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 is it cool? I guess uh, some people it may be. Um, it was a two, two hard years, I'll be honest. So, um, so in moving on, I guess, um, you know, We've talked about the free surf sort of part of Nomad and, the, you know, you talked about the devastation of um, Josh Kirkman when you, you sort of missed that heat and you yep. know, at Pipe and all the rest of it. And um, I guess for me personally, we've had you involved. You've, you've come on board with us at Body Body Victoria and we, we once again, it's a standard Shane Britton thing. We don't talk about it much, but the support you've been able to give the organisation. Under promise, over deliver. That's right. Yep. I, well, I love it, Danny. Like, to be honest, um, getting involved, especially in, in the beginning with the Morning to Peninsula Bodyboard Club um, was a, a lot to do with my son. Yep. Um, you know, he'd done pretty well in nippers and competing and uh, he was a good board paddler. Um, I haven't really mentioned him to date with this podcast. So I got my son Brody, who's just turned 20 and my daughter Kyla, who's just turned 16. Uh, she's still in high school. Brody works in the film industry at the moment. So, uh, but, um, yeah, Brody at the time was doing, you know, as a junior doing really well at Nippers and, you know, really showed an aptitude to, to want to come and, and bodyboard, which, you know, I try not to push too hard, but, uh, it was good to see him sort of pick up the board and, and, and want to get involved. So, uh, you know, he pushed me down to the club and that's when I first, you know, really started competing as well. So, you know, I didn't really start competing, I think, until I was 40, 41. So, um, I, I still remember, like... It was one of those stupid things. You, know, you, you I, I love bodyboarding and I've loved it since I was 11 years old. Yeah. And I just didn't want to be told I was no good. Yeah. And one of those... Well, no one, no one wants to be told that. No, no, absolutely. And, <laughs> you know, I, I always thought competing, you know, and you get scores and you go, oh, fuck, you know, yeah. that's no good. Yeah. So, uh, but, you know, I just had a high passion for it. So, you know, I sort of followed the bodyboarding for me has always been about mateship, um, you know, traveling, whether it be, you know, traveling from Melbourne down here to, you know, with a group of mates or you know, doing what the three of us even do now yep. um, is always a good time. And that's what bodyboarding has been for me. And I think it's it's always what it is for, for everyone, whether it be that or that you've got a competitive spirit or, you know, you, you want to be a solo sort of surfer as well. Like yep. we've got a couple of mates that are like that. So, um, but yeah, Brody getting involved and then me getting involved with the club and me going, oh, this, this is good. I really enjoy the club sort of stuff. Like Mick Parker would try to get me a few times, to, you know, into GCBC events. I'm just, no, mate, I'm just here. I'm just happy to watch and hanging out. Yeah, working, yeah. working on your just tan. hanging out, hanging out, mate. <laughs> just hanging out. You know, and, you know, I actually made good mates from just hanging out up there and and chatting. Um, you know, Brett Hanna and all those guys. So, um, yeah, but then I, I realised oh, that's a really good group of people to be around, and and the way the club is down here now it's just a really good group of mates and it's re- always really appreciated you step up and take things on like you know i think you've done 
a stack of judging hours and whatnot and you know even things like I just love setting up tents mate that's, yeah. you know, that's, yeah. what, that's what I'm really there for it, it, so, it all comes the, back to lifting yeah, heavy yeah, things, yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just give, <laughs> give me someone heavier lift and uh, I'm on my way and, and Mark, Mark Britton cheer squad yeah yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> the um, you know, I know you've had the background in before that. You sort of got pretty heavily involved in, I guess, like the the life saving club. And you know, we we're pretty stoked to have you on uh, bodyboarding, Vic. You know, it's it's been quite good. But sort of, where do you see? Where would you like to see bodyboarding uh, competitions in the future? And what what's your sort of vision for that? Yeah, I, I really think at the moment, um, I think people kind of think too big a yep. lot of the time. Um, it's got to come back down to club level, um, and from club club level, you get some really good administrators and people that can run sort of organisations and stuff from there. And then from that, it goes up to the next level. Yep. You know, being you know an ABA type type level, um, and really go back to a national level. And then, you know, I'm not going to sort of rubbish anyone but I don't I don't know much about the IBC at the moment it's um, I don't see any information about it I don't really understand what's going on with the world tour to a certain degree um, I'd really love to see that come back to a more open um, yeah to be a lot more open and communicative a lot more public yeah yeah absolutely and communicative and well I mean they, they're <laughs> personally I, I, you know I might be stupid, but I, th- I think the World Tour should be three events. Yep. Um, I think that's what bodyboarders can afford at the moment. Um, and I think that would provide a structure that we can build around and grow. Yeah, absolutely. If you had to pick three event locations yep. to, to crown a world champion for yep. a world tour, where would they be oh. and in what order? Uh, pipe 100%. Yep. To start or to finish? To start. Yep. Yeah. Pipe? I th- well, you you watch so many events. You know, there was local events, you know, world tour events, everything there over summer. Yeah. Um, that were broadcast around the world. You could watch, you know, on multiple platforms and so forth. So, I, I you know, and I watched every single one. It was it was fantastic. You know, and, and including the Wyoming comp as well, which you know obviously isn't that pipe, but that everything that happened on the North Shore, everyone knew exactly what was going on. There were so many comps and events and they all ran fantastic all had you know great uh tv coverage and everything as well so pipe obviously it can happen there really well um well it's got the history it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a proven formula that you can run an incredibly successful yeah and there's crowds event. there yeah. and everything as well and and, and interested audience yep. um so that would be one well the other two, I, you know, I, I'd love something in Australia, but um, to be honest, I'd be happy something really good at national level at Australia. Um, We're working on it. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So, yeah, like wherever the other two are, I don't really care. I, Fronton? I, uh, you know, I watched part of that event. I, the guys that ride it well really ride it well. There was a lot of guys that, out there that didn't look comfortable and, you know, I'd be in their shoes as well. I wouldn't be comfortable out there either. What about um, Arika then? Uh, that's obviously a really well-run event. Um, yeah, probably it's a, nice a little wave. bit more of a competitive wave in terms of what you can do. Yeah, like, f- f- let let's be honest, Fronton is a very short, punchy wave. Yeah, um, Arika has a lot more length down the line. Got that kind of opportunity to really use the face, the barrel, and the end section. Well, that's what you'd like to see. I, you know, you love you know everyone loves waves of consequence, but at the same time, I'd like to see. A bodyboarder on a really well ridden wave, yeah. you know, whether it be a point break or, you know, beachy or whatever. Um, and it'd be nice to have a, a, a mix of, you know, the three really. Um, so if you just have having that- waves of consequence all the time, like, yeah, it's okay if you've got Red Bull as your sponsor. Um, outside of that, I don't think it really suits everyone and everyone's needs. And, you know, you get to watch the WSL and the amount of different waves they're held in. And, you know, we just watched onshore bells and, I still found it, you know, enthralling. I, so, I really enjoyed that event. If there was to be a world tour event in Australia. Yep. Oh, oh. don't ask me where. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, the, the clock's ticking. Wow. There's been many of uh, many of discussion about that. Yeah, mm. yeah. Like I love D-Bar. Yep. Um, I think it's, you know, an amazing wave. 
Um, you know, you know but- box. But I think box is a bit remote. I'd like to see a comp held in. Um, well, like you said, if you, you, you're, looking, you're looking for variety, right? You got pipe yep. and Eureka. Um, eh, essentially, both lefts and reef breaks. But yeah, I guess throw that beach into the yeah, mix, yeah. Right? It'd be nice to see something like that. But um, you know, you can't guarantee good waves there either. But you know, well, there's 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 no guarantees. Yeah, absolutely, mate. I think that's about it in terms of the the big questions. Uh, and as we did in last week's set, mate, we're just going to finish off with some quick fire round questions. You ready? Hit me. So, F- favorite band. Favorite band. Uh, it's always been not Foo Fighters. No. <laughs> <laughs> always growing up, uh, Van Halen, led by David Lee Roth. Yeah. Um, was my favourite. I, I'd, I'd put Joy Division as my second at this point. Yep. So those two bands in particular, and I've seen them both. So I haven't seen Joy Division, but I've seen New Order and I've seen Peter Hook Live, um, which he does all the Joy Division songs. Favourite film? All right. I'm a big, I love film. I think you guys know that. Yeah. <laughs> I pretty much watch everything, watch every prestige TV show and everything as well. Back 25 years ago, I would have said Jaws um, and that flowed into naming my son after the main character in Jaws, Brody, uh, after Chief Brody in, in, in the film. Um, so, he- not Matt Brody from Baywatch. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, that, that's almost more fitting, you know, <laughs> considering the time you guys have spent in Surf Life. Yeah, you? yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd still say Jaws, but, you know, there's a lot of other films that are on par with that at this point. Favourite car? The old Highlight, mate. The high on the Highlight. <laughs> like, what else? Just a man in a van travelling the country. Like, jeez. And, and on, on top of that, it gets that much humour. Like, I get that much piss taken out of me for driving that. It's, it's, it's a reliable a, automobile. a man in a van. Get, like. Gets you from point A to point Z. <laughs> yep. How often do you think people write stuff in your dirty windscreen? Oh, anytime Blair Johnstone's around, it's, it's written. <laughs> uh, you blokes as well, even my son. Uh, how long you had the eye load now? Uh, I think it's a 2009. Wow. So, it's, it's getting old. And still, and it's, still running yeah, like yeah. a dream. The, the worst Turbo problem. diesels, mate, they, they'll go forever. It's done 270,000 uh, K. And it's about to do another trip around. Do you know what's not going well in that van is the mattress. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, we were talking about him. You're, re- you're casting aspersions on that. <laughs> we were talking about him replacing the iLoad and the new version of the iLoad oh. is the most hideous looking car. The Staria or whatever it oh, is. That's, uh, like the, it looks really spacey, right? Yeah. It's yeah, like, oh, yeah. 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 It's futuristic. Yeah. 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 You'd love it. I would. <laughs> uh, my favorite TV show? Oh, there's a few. Uh, the Wire. Oh, yeah. HBO, The Wire, um, Deadwood, yep, Sopranos. This is how much TV I watch because I've never. You've heard never of heard of any of them, and they're pretty much the top three <laughs> shows on. Right. Yeah. Yep. But uh, yeah, those three. But- I live in a national park. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't got the internet, have you? He doesn't have TV. <laughs> you got two tin cans to get to speak to the bloke next door. Uh, coconut wireless, mate. Coconut wireless. <laughs> uh, favorite bodyboarding film. Uh, you-, you can be biased. Yep. I can be really biased and Absolutely. I will say uh, one of the things that kept me in bodyboarding very early on was Riptide and the underground tapes. Oh, and yes. it doesn't matter what film of the underground tapes, I'm a massive fan of Strowey's stuff. Strowey, yeah, in terms of having someone to look up to uh, when you first get into the industry, I definitely looked up to Strowey. Um, and I think those films in particular really um, – Basically, you know, put a, a lot of impact on my music taste and that as well. So, you know, Front End Loader, Friends of Rom, yep. um, all those sorts of bands, you know, Seaweed Gorillas, all, you know, Spider Bait, you know, all those bands really, yeah, was with my developing through the 80s and 90s and, yeah. Secondary oh. question to that, favourite film that you've produced? Do you have a favourite? Oh, Jesus. Um... Uh, Ah, uh, they're all they're all fun. They've all been fun. <laughs> I, I was going to say before, Benny, um, 
Shane and I were talking just this week and we were talking about my old man's got a quite extensive surf video collection going down to see Pete Wilco and get the latest underground tape. Yeah. VHS. Yeah. VHS. Yeah. I reckon that was part of the reason he, that day because I was going, oh, when's the, when's the underground tapes coming? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then weirdly, I didn't actually have the original underground tapes until really? much later. I started basically from underground tapes too because I couldn't find it in Victoria. I ended up buying it I don't know, six or seven years later through the trading post. Wow. <laughs> That's how old school I am, boys and girls. <laughs> the uh, old trading Shane post. Shane has pulled out the trading post. Oh, and twice, he What's he asking? <laughs> <laughs> Tell him he's dreaming. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got a VHS player, which we were, uh, and we've got a stack of old films. I've got bodyboarding enough, said all those real. Old I can just envision you with the, the old <laughs> wall hung dial phones with the, the spiral curve. <laughs> Like, you know, before even 5-2 came into to, or fi- the 5-5 five, five You numbers. like to say no how much of the dream you've been living just on the mobile phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Favourite bodyboard film section? Ooh. Uh, I, I can't remember which one. I think it's Underground 2. Uh, it's Why Me Ashori and it's to a song by a band. Uh, it's called Wish by a band called Presto. And every time I watch that, I, just, I love the music. Um, I went and found that band. They had a, a little cassette tape uh, in Gaslight Records in Melbourne. No way. That was the only – I looked forever and just happened to come across it in Gaslight. Yeah, right. Um, which was a really great, un, you know, underground music shop in Melbourne that I think has closed down a long time ago. There's um there's a underground tapes uh, and rush uh, um, playlist on Spotify. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I've been listening to and yeah, some of the tunes on there, yeah, absolutely epic. Yeah, yeah. Like all the original, like the, yeah, the first front and loader album. Mm. I was lucky to sort of um, with um, the DK online film we made with Lackey and and the boys a couple of years ago. I had the opportunity and, and, and contacted the guys at Front End Loader mm. and they let us use one of their songs So awesome um, for that project. So, yeah, it's fun and games. Have you ever been mistaken for someone famous? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 unfortunately, yes. Uh, multiple people. Multiple, too, yeah. t- multiple times and multiple people. Um, one, one time in particular was with Benny <laughs> on the Gold Coast. Uh, and I think we'll want. What were we wandering out of? And I think it I, was, uh, I, look, it was a. It's a well-known American restaurant that uh, we were wandering out of. It uh, sounds like an owl. Anyhow, we're wandering out of there, and <laughs> I think it was next door to the Broad Beach Hotel. But in the Dunnies, the windows opened up, and guys could you know have a piss and fucking look out the window. And we're just walking through the car park, and this bloke yells out, "Hey!" Super bad. <laughs> and, and all I got for you, I don't know if he was referring to Jonah Hill or Seth Rogen, what I look like, but uh, that's all Benny called me for many yeah. years. <laughs> <laughs> oh. um, but uh, the last couple of years, I've had three times I've been asked if I was crammed from Spider Bait, <laughs> which is really weird. I was at a Happy Mondays gig at the forum in the city and a bloke said, am I... Uh, and my cram and then I went we had storage we had to do some storage off site for our company and uh, went in and the lady thought she knew cram really well because he stores like prestige cars at the same storage place and she said oh cram how you going oh Oh no, you're not cram. Yeah. So I've had it a couple of times. You should have said, Yeah, I am. Now, yeah, where's, yeah, yeah. where's, where's my case? prestige card? Yeah, where's my prestige card? <laughs> First board. Uh, was that board, but my first- The, the board, rubber board? Yeah, the, but my first good board was a Mac 7. Uh, Still got it? Oh, hell no. We were we were poor, mate. We didn't- If I need a new board- I Even more sell, reason to hold on to it. Had to sell that and put the money towards the new one. Right. So, I think uh, that one was okay. I got the 7SS, the original one with the raised rails. The blue rails on it. Yeah, which I really loved. Um, then that died, and then I got the the second seven SS that had the channel instead of the raised rail. Yeah. I had the, right. the channel, yeah. the thumb grips, 
and that was terrible. And that was the last time I rode a Mori. Well, wow. was that yeah. the last time you rode a Dow Core as well? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I went from there. I got a Lethal Custom from Manta, uh, and I rode that until we started Nomad Boards. And I regret. It's probably the only board I kind of regret getting rid of, but I usually get rid of all my boards after I've finished riding them. I don't like sitting on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Weirdly, it's weird, but uh, I don't. I don't really save any of my boards. Favorite surf trip. Uh, the Cook Islands was fun. Uh, had a good one to the Maldives with my brothers, with my brothers and, and my wife, Nikki. Uh, that was really fun. A couple of good trips to Bali with Blair Johnstone. <laughs> I was really looking forward to Sumatra. I think that would have been amazing that we got cancelled on. Yeah, we won't talk about that. No, no. Yeah, <clears throat> I know you've had a different experience to me with that. But, um, yeah, but I, oh, and I've had a couple of amazing trips down the whole East Coast with my brothers and some mates and my wife and, uh, yeah, up to basically Byron Bay and, and back. Good times. Uh, Favourite move? Oh, I just get barreled, mate. You know that. <laughs> big, big waves and duck dives. <laughs> Barrel to cut back. Yep, barrel to cutty. Uh, that's that's my go-to. Throwing buckets. Yeah, yeah. In terms of watching moves, I really like air forwards. I think you know, they look sick. Do you think air forwards is almost like a, a lost art? You just, I feel like in the early 2000s, you saw them a lot more. And then, yeah, yeah, the air, like, then the air rev took over. Yeah, yeah. Like there's a lot of good photos of Mike back in the day. Oh, um, Spencer Skipper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't, I, you know, I, I loved Grizz's air forwards, you know, back yeah. when he was, you know, yeah. filming with his us. His big legs. His big boy. So getting big frame out of the water. Um, yeah, but I think air forwards look yeah, pretty sick. And, you know, when it's smooth and you just, you know, get back on the wave. And- it's an incredible air rev that uh, air forward that Jace Finlay does in six months at Lunas. And, again, Lunas is not a wave that is generally man, known for forward. its air bowls. Yeah, yeah. And, man, he's, he's dead flat. It's, yeah. it's wild. What about your favourite board? Uh, my favourite board's always the one I'm currently riding. Yep. And the board I'm currently riding... I've actually just changed boards. I've been riding uh, Nomad Ultimates 43 inch for a long time. Um, and I've just decided I'm going up a size and I've jumped on the Lachlan Cramsey Poly Pro 44 inch. That's not the quad channel? No, no. just this flat. It, uh, the tra- just the you know, standard, standard channel. It's funny. I see a bit of a trend at the moment. There's a, there's a number of people I know who have gone up half a size or a size. Yeah, yeah. The benefits. That extra inch, as my wife has always said to me, uh, <laughs> just makes all the difference. <laughs> oh, so, uh, I was going to say. We're sorry, Nikki. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. I tried hard she'd to expect control. That. She'd expect that. She'd be shaking her head right now. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, sort of, uh, yeah, quite a few people have sort of stepped up and, you know, Mark, your brother went up. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was on a 41. He's gone up to a 42. And it- I've gone from 43 to 44 and I find it incredible. Um, like, you know, there was that stage where everyone was going down yeah. in sizes and, you know, now, I mean, I mean you hear a bit, you know, a lot of, you know, the well-known pros, you know, riding really big boards, especially yeah. in comps to give them a lot more flotation and everything. And, you know, I was just wasn't quite comfortable on the 43 anymore. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, gone up to the 44 and, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how it sort of changes and it changes your riding in that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I, I think also, you know, um, probably in, in wrapping up, um, <clears throat> you've done a lot for the industry, like you said, yes. you've managed to do one thing I picked up on one of the, po- the, the podcasts you did with, um, with Josh Kirkman was that you've managed to have a board brand that's been around for longer than uh, a lot of others. And you've seen the demise of some of the bigger brands during that time. And, you know, you've, you've stayed in the, the background and my hat's off to you. You know, it's something, it's, it's an incredible achievement and, and what you deliver for the sport. So cheers, man. I appreciate uh, it. Um, yeah. Thank you for everything you've done. No, thanks. And thank both of you. Cause, uh, you two keep me motivated on a personal level. Um, you know, business is business, but, um, yeah, friendship with you guys is uh, is always good times. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, that wraps things up for episode two of the Closeout Bodyboarding Podcast. Once again, big shout out to Sam Watson in production, Michael Jennings for tech support, and Rob Porteous and his band Remote for the music. 
Coming up on our next episode, I think we're Benny gonna- O. <laughs> we're going to talk about the chronicles of Benny O. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it depends on what era. <laughs> <laughs> push the lead, push the lead. <laughs> uh, so once again, uh, to all our listeners, thanks, and uh, yeah, stay tuned for the next step. <laughs>